Well, welcome everybody. We're so thrilled to have a turnout from within the university and outside the university for one of the kickoff events of the year of the Georgian Arena Schaefer Center. The President's Office is co-sponsoring this event because this is something that obviously um, the topic of tonight's event falls squarely under the aegis and mission of our Center for the Study of Genocide. So it's a very great pleasure to hold tonight an event such as this one, which is the account of how nine determined women fled a Nazi concentration camp to reach France and join the resistance. And one of those people just happened to be our speaker's great aunt. So this is a personal story of discovery as well. So tonight we welcome Gwen Strauss, who is a poet, a writer, and director of the Dora Mar House in Minerve, Vaucluse, France. The Dor Dora Mar is a name that some of you probably recognize. She was not just a mistress of Picasso. That was not her life's work. She actually was a, an active painter for 40 years after her liaison with Picasso. And there's been a wonderful exhibit at the uh, Pompidou of her work. She lived in Ménère, uh, France. And uh, today it's an artist, uh, artist in residence um, program that Gwen runs and that really uh, brings kind of art and culture and to the Luberon and allows uh, working artists and creative people to practice their, to work on their practice and refine their practice. So Gwen is not only the director of the Dora Maher House, but she has a very important story to tell you tonight. The mission of the Schaefer Center is to promote innovative research, curricula, and pedagogies leading to the deeper understanding of the causes and the consequences of genocide and mass violence. Via the Schaefer Center, AUP has full access to the visual history archives of USC and since last June to the Fortunoff video archive for Holocaust testimonies at Yale University as well. And we are, I believe, the only institution in France that makes the visual history archive available to the public, that provides lots of opportunities for teachers in France to have access, teachers and researchers to have access to these materials, and we're very proud that we play uh, that role in, in France. So Gwen's forthcoming book of nonfiction, which is called The Nine, The True Story of Female Resistance Fighters, follows the story of her great aunt, Hélène Podiaski, Podiaski, who led nine women as they escaped this concentration camp and made a 10-day dangerous journey across the front lines of World War II to France. Please come in. The Nine is an exploration of a lot of complex themes. The relationship between collective and individual memory, the moral complexity of visiting sites of suffering, the solidarity of women, particularly women in desperate situations, the healing of transgenerational trauma, through the pursuit of truth, the meaning of bravery then and now, and the vital importance of giving voice to our narratives which, in cases such as this one in particular, lay balm upon the sorest of wounds. So the whole notion of creating narratives of trauma because of their healing capacity is terribly important. It will be illustrated by Gwen's talk tonight, but as many of the students know, it's also a theme in courses at AUP. We teach courses in the politics of memory. We teach courses in narratives of trauma. Um, in the nine, Gwen makes extensive use of oral history and written testimonies demonstrating how rich these sources can be when there is no other written trace of individuals and their personal paths through major swaths of history, particularly destructive history. As her work demonstrates, oral history is not only about documenting the past, it's about the power of voices in the present to give life to history. And this evening, we will be giving life to the history of this group of remarkable women. Amongst the wonders wrought by Gwen's work is, first, the way her research unfolded like a detective story. And I hope she will tell you some of the remarkable twists and turns in this story as she pieced it together. All scholars know that research often takes that form. You have these unexpected clues, and they lead to down a corridor, and then suddenly you discover manuscripts or people or, or, or testimony that contributes to the story. But it was particularly so in this instance. Another of the wonders wrought by it was the peace that it ended up bringing to descendants of the Nine, many of whom had never known the whole story, had never been approached to give testimony, had only held the trauma, uh, sometimes unconsciously, within them. Her writing of this book has had a vast uh, healing impact on the present. 
No less remarkable is Gwen herself. Gwen is a widely published, lauded, and translated author and poet. She's based in southern France, where she was formerly the director of the Lacoste campus of Savannah College of Arts and Design, which is in Lacoste, right next to Minau in the south of France. Today, she directs the Dora Mar House. And um, uh, soon, very soon, we hope, Dora Mar will pass from the hands of the Houston Museum of Fine Arts to full independence as a nonprofit association in France. And we're eagerly awaiting that moment. Gwen has written many powerful and prize winning books for, for children, which many of them deal with moral dilemmas. Her numerous essays have been published in the New Republic, the London Sunday Times, the New England Review, the Kenyan Review, and Antioch Review, among others. She has written about a whole range of things, from honor killings in Afghanistan to family circuses in post-Cold War Europe, and, about, and also about traveling by train through Uzbekistan. We recognize Gwen as one of our own. She is a true global explorer. She was born in Haiti. She spent her early childhood in Haiti and in Malaysia, and she's lived as an adult in Mexico, Japan, Holland, and France just to name a few random countries. <laughs> so Gwen, without further ado, we're thrilled to have you here tonight to share your story. Thank you. Thank you, Celeste. That was a very kind introduction. Um, and thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone for coming. I honestly felt that would be about five people. <laughs> so so I, I think I um, made my aunt able to like, send out emails. And, you know, so, um, so really, I'm so grateful for all of you to have come tonight. I'm really grateful for the invitation from Celeste to give this presentation. All the much more because um, before, I, she invited me to use the, um, the archive, the visual archive. And that was, an, I'll talk about it in, in my um, presentation because it really was an incredible uh, uh, a treasure for me. There was a, one of my nine women is in the archive, so I had two and a half hours of recorded oral history that I didn't know existed until I started to work with the archive here at AUP. So thank you very, very much. Um, uh, as, as, as Celeste told you, this, this is a book that I'm in the process of writing, so it's, it's not written yet. <laughs> there's, there's a rough draft that's been given to my editor, and it's due in March of 2020. So this winter I'll be finishing it, I hope. Um, and it should come out around nine months later. Um, and as, as Celeste explained, it's a story about an escape. Um, so, um, how about going to the next slide? The way this story, this what I'm gonna talk to you about tonight is really uh, the discovery of the nine. It's not so much, you'll have to get the book to read about the escape. <laughs> but what I'm gonna talk about is how I actually uncovered the story and how I evolved to think that maybe this was a book instead of what I originally thought was just an essay or maybe even nothing. Um, so the story started with my great aunt, Helen Podiaski. Um, one day I was having lunch with her and my grandmother in 2002, <coughs> and she told this remarkable story about how she escaped from a slave labor camp with, nine, with eight other women and um, uh, escaped. And after nine days of traveling across central Saxony, Germany, found the American troops. I was so surprised by the story, I asked her if, I could, if we could make an appointment where I could come back and really record it, which I did with my Aunt Ava. She and I went, I think a couple of months later, maybe even a year later, to Hélène's apartment and we recorded the story. And then uh, Ava made a transcript of it and later Ellen edited the transcript and I think she donated that transcript to an archive uh, later on. And I didn't really do anything with it. I was busy having children and moving and having my life, but I, it was always in my head as, as, as something. What, the story that she told was remarkable. She was 83 at the time, and it had happened when she was 23 years old, so it was a dis distance of 60 years. Um, and I knew that she was a remarkable, brilliant mathematician and, and engineer, and she talked about her time in the resistance. Um, she was arrested in May 1943. I mean, she joined the resistance in May 1943, was arrested in February 34. <coughs> Those years are really important in this whole history because you'll see that almost all of the women joined in 43 and were arrested in 44. And that really follows the uh, sort of the trend of the war for the resistance. In 43, this is when really there's a huge burst of small resistance units without, throughout France. Partly because the Germans have now invaded the southern zone, they, they dropped all pretense of having free Vichy, and there was much more resistance 
you know, groundswell of resistance. There was also the beginning of the forced labor, the STO. So people were, were resisting against that. And so you start to see these nascent groups starting up all over um, and people joining. And the problem was they were not trained. And the average span that someone lasted in the resistance was six months before being arrested. So, and at the end of 19, um, in uh, 1944, there was a terrible, the Gestapo were really grinding all these units down and there's massive sweeps and arrests and killing. So and you can really see that trend in, in these women. So I'll go on to the next slide. So how the project evolved. At first to me it was just a family story. And then be, I thought, well I'll write an essay about it. So um, then I decided to write the essay. I had to go to Germany, which I did. And then that led to more trips to Germany. And then I decided um, I should visit the archives. And then I started to meet some of the relatives and that led to more questions. And then finally the idea about writing a book. But really, I heard the story in 2002. I started really thinking about it in 2016. And it really, I started to understand that it was a book after my first trip to Germany. <coughs> Another really important part of this detective <laughs> story was um, Suzanne Modi Zaza. She's one of the nine women. I'm gonna introduce you to all nine during this talk. Um, she wrote a book called Me fille jeune qui ne voulait pas mourir. And that book came out in 2004. And so this is two years after I've interviewed my aunt, and my, my aunt Ava and my uncle Michel called me up and said, there's this book that's exactly the same story as the one that Hélène told. And in the book, we figured out Hélène was Christine, which was, in fact, her nom de guerre, and which would turn out to be the name that she used in all the Nazi records. That's how she's known as Christine, Christine Poliaski. And so when we showed it to Hélène, she, in fact, agreed, yes, Zaza was her friend, and this was the story. So this book, allowed me to have a real access to the story in a way because Zaza wrote this account of just the escape. She doesn't talk about the resistance. She doesn't talk about her time in the camps. She does, certainly doesn't talk about her life afterwards because she wrote it immediately afterwards. She talks only about those nine days. But, um, but she wrote it immediately after being uh, liberated, after they were liberated. And it was a, a manuscript that passed around to her family. And um, uh, you know, I think she made an attempt to get it published in Marie Claire magazine and it was turned down. And um, later on, her, her nephew, um, who decided to type it up, and he, after she died, he really pushed um, getting it published, and you can see, um, he, her, it, was pushed, it was published 20 years after her death, and it was published two years after I had heard this story from Alain. From, uh, she, one other thing I wanted to say about her is that she was part of the Auberge de Jeunesse movement called Agistes. Um, which was a, uh, it, it start, this had started uh, after the Great War. People would go camping in Germany, and it was a German idea that the French took on as well, this idea that if the youth went to the mountains and enjoyed nature and camped, we would never have war again. They would, so it was one of these utopian ideals after the Great War of how we could fix the world. Um, when the Germans invaded France, uh, it was allowed to continue to exist, the uh, Auberge de Jeunesse, until the head of the Auberge refused to go along with the idea that no Jews would be allowed. So it was disbanded and went underground. And it became a way for the resistance to recruit people. Because as soon as young men would become the age that they would have to be sent to deported for the service travail obligatoire in Germany, the Agis would contact them because they had their birth dates and their names and say, do you want to go on a camping trip? And they would, you know, just before you have to go to Germany, we'll take you to the mountains. And in the mountains, if they would feel it out, and if they seemed open to it, they'd say, if you don't want to go to Germany, there's an alternative. And the alternative is we can set you up to go underground into the resistance. But this group was very, again, untrained. They weren't spies. They were campers. <laughs> you know? So there was a gigantic sweep of the Gestapo, and almost all of them were arrested in um, March of 1944. And she was deported on the exact same train as, as in an. So From her book, I learned the names of all of the women. I didn't know who they were, but I knew their nicknames, their nom de guerre. So there's Christine with Len, that's Zaza, that's Nicole, that's Lon, Gigi, uh, Jose, Mena, Zinka, and, and um, Jacqueline. Again, I didn't know what they looked like, I just had those names. The next person I discovered in the group was Nicole Clavonsky Levy from, an art, from the miracle of the internet. <laughs> I came across an article that she wrote in 1964 for Elle magazine about the escape. And again, it was another story that was the same story. And I realized this must be the Nicole in the group. Um, she joined the resistance in early July 1943 at the age of 20, but she was actually in it earlier as an éclaireur, a scout. 
At the time, she would go on scouting missions with her Boy Scout troop. She was the leader, and she would gather information about the implantation of Germans' bunkers along the coast in the south, and she would pass that on to a contact she had, who happened to be working for the Alliance Network, which was run, if you don't know, maybe many of you know, was run by Mary Madeleine Falcard, uh, a woman who, who ran one of the most important intelligence networks throughout the war. Of course, she had no idea that's who she was working for, but she did that at a young age. Eventually, she became officially in the resistance, and she actually had to, um, rose to quite a level of responsibility. She was arrested in August of 1944, which, um, the date you can probably tell, was not a great, that was right when Paris was about to be liberated. So it was a really, it was the, the, the people are desperate, there's the, there's the allies are coming, there's a kind of massive, uh, um, really murderous uh, efforts to, to get all the underground and resistance units, and she was caught in that, um, and she was taken to a black site. So even on Rue de la Pompe, and so even the Gestapo had a thing called a black site, which was outside of the law, because the Gestapo considered that they were working within the law, and on this Rue de la Pompe site is infamous because it was run by the criminal underground thugs and psychopaths. She was kept there and tortured, and then she was deported on the very last transport out of Paris. At that time, so this August is a few days before Paris is going to be liberated, and um, she's um, put on a train that they wouldn't even, the, there were no trains leaving from Gabalest anymore. It was from Gabalpatin because even the Cheminots were on Cleve. Everybody was sure that Paris was about to be liberated. And this group was actually sent out, um, thinking the whole time that if surely they weren't going to end up in Germany. She said that she felt, you know, any minute now, if the, the liberation would catch up to them. But in fact, when she looked out at one point, they looked out of the car and they saw the signs in German and they all started to cry. She's the one that had recorded two and a half hours at the Shoah, the USC Shoah um, visual archive. And it was amazing to hear her story, to see her talking about it. She was Jewish. Um, but she didn't talk about that. She, nobody, I, I don't even know if the others knew. Ellen's father was also Jewish. I'm not sure if they talked about it. Um, it's one of the things I'm trying to figure out how much of those details they, they, they shared. It was more important. It was better to be a political prisoner than to be a Jewish prisoner. Um, so she was one of the 5,700. That's the number that they got when they arrived at Ravensburg. The number started with 57. So that's a famous group of the last deported from, from France. One of the things about that group is they came to, they came to uh, the camp with incredible hope. They believed the war was over in a month or two. And they really gave morale to the rest of the group. Unfortunately, they're gonna have, they had nine more months in, in, in terrible conditions. And the fourth person I was able to find, you know, in the beginning searches was Madeleine, um, or called Lone. That was when, in 2010, two Dutch filmmakers made a short documentary about the escape from Lon's point of view. She wrote a book in Dutch called, called Unsnapped, or Mein War Chronique. And then they, um, they came to, they met, Ellen and, and Lon met, um, and they hadn't seen each other in 65 years, so that was the end, that's the end of the documentary. Um, Lon came, so in the group of, of nine, I should tell you this, there were six French, two Dutch, and one Spanish. They were all in their 20s. There wasn't anyone over 20. Um, she came with her friend Guigui Guillemet um, to uh, Paris to join her brother Eric in the resistance. And they had the misfortune of arriving the night before the whole Hotel de was going to be raided by the Gestapo's and the whole network was, was betrayed and turned in. So she walked right into a trap. She never was able to join. She was deported in June of 1944. So at this point, I had four points of view of the story. I had the story told from Hélène, from Zaza, from Non, and from Nicole, but I didn't know who the other five were. I, didn't, I just knew that their names. I knew Mena, Jackie, Zinka, and Gigi, and Jose. So I decided to go to Germany to retrace the route of the escape with my daughter, Sophie. We started at Leipzig, Leipzig which is, um, we visited the Memorial Museum for the Leipzig Hasek Slave Labor Camp because I knew from the, the accounts that I read that they had been in Ravensbrück and then they had been sent to be slave labor at, the, um, at this camp in Leipzig, which was a satellite camp of Buchenwald. The, this, is a, you know, this is the point in the war when uh, the Germans are doing very badly. <laughs> They're, they've lost with Russia on the Eastern Front. And they believe, delusionally really, that if they just can build up their V2 rockets and their armaments that they have a chance. But they have no more labor because many of their men 
have been lost on the Eastern Front. And so they decide to use slave labor to, to and they create these series of satellite camps, hundreds of them, from the large concentration camps. So you have the large camps like Buchenwald, Auschwitz, uh, Ravensburg, uh, Dachau, and from those there was, each one of those had 50 or you know, 60 satellite la labor camps. And the idea was to literally uh, work the people to death. So this, in, in Leipzig is where they, the women lived for almost a year. And here's where they really formed a strong friendship state. Six of them, I'm sorry, seven of them met in Ravensburg. And they were able to make sure that they got selected to go to Leipzig together. Because in, in Ravensburg there would be these selections and they would try to make sure that their friends didn't, you know, that they stuck together and that they would all be chosen to this, for the same place. Um, and also during selections, what could happen very easily is that you would be selected for extermination. So it was a time when you had to like try to make your you know, lips bright and your cheek. Everyone did everything to try to make themselves look really healthy and strong. If you got selected in a group and you looked around you and they were all healthy and strong, you could feel good about it. If you got selected and put in a group that were older women, you were pretty sure that was the end. So they were very excited, they were happy in a way, happy. They were um, pleased that they were gotten selected and sent to Leipzig. And then when they were Leipzig, two more arrived later, who would be um, Nicole and, and uh, Jackie. There were really strong friendships and acts of solidarity that were quite powerful that happened in Leipzig that I've read about. There's been some beautiful books written about it and lots of survivor testimonies from the French resistance women who've written about this time. One of them, and there's many moving stories, but one of them is um, La Gamelle de la Solidarité, which was, um, of course, they were, had, they were starving and they had, you know, they were, had very little to eat, but they, they would, each night, they would have a gamelle, and each person who felt they could would put a spoonful of food into that gamelle, and then they would decide who needed it that night. Maybe someone had been beaten badly that day, or maybe someone had found out some terrible news, or someone was, they could tell was going towards depression, which ended in death always. So they had this way that they would try to build each other up and stick together. They also did a thing called, a, they did festival, they tried to celebrate birthdays of their children. They also did something really wonderful, I found out, which has is, which is only recently been started to talk about, which is they recited recipes and wrote down recipe books. They would sit down as at night before they would go to sleep, and they would delouse, they would try to pick the lice out of the, each other because it, lice was so dangerous, you could get typhoid and typhus, and it was a really important thing to be fastidious about getting as many lice as possible before you went to sleep. And while they did that, one person would recite how to make cassoulet, but detail by detail by detail. And they said that, in fact, the worst thing wasn't the beatings, the worst thing was the hunger. It was actually a physical pain to be that hungry. And for the moment when they were talking about the meal, they were relieved from that feeling. And it was as if they could eat the meal together. They also said that it was a way to have a memory that wasn't too painful. If you remembered your family that had died or you knew a, ch a child, that was almost a dangerous thing to think about that could actually put you over the edge into depression. But you could think about meals. It was a kind of happy memory that was shared and a little bit less sharp. And then they would start to steal little pieces of paper and write these down and pass them around. And of course, after the war, they didn't talk about it because it seemed too feminine and banal and not, it wasn't like a political poem or a tract, so it wasn't noble. It wasn't the narrative that was told after the war about these heroic resistance fighters. And so it only really, a few generations later, did people start to say there was these, show these little recipe books that they wrote and that they kept. I find it really um, moving. Of course, the conditions in Leipzig were better than in Hoffman's book, but they were still awful. There was starvation, fatigue, lack of hygiene, brutal beatings, and continued selection for the extermination camps. At this point, they all knew about the gassing. They all knew about the extermination. They had people... Um, it, when, when Auschwitz was almost overrun by the uh, Russians, the, there was a death march of Auschwitz prisoners to Leipzig, so they heard from them firsthand what was going on. So they knew what would happen when they got selected. In Leipzig, they were working making Panzerfaust. They worked, which was a German rocket held grenade launcher. They worked 12 hours a day. They had a quota of seven tons per person. They, of course, they were injured often. But they worked to sabotage. And this is the thing my aunt was quite proud of and she talked to us about. She was able, because she was an engineer, and because she befriended the foreman of the factory, um, Franz Stupitz, um, she worked to, she could, uh, the, she changed the thermostat. So it would say that it was hotter when it wasn't. And then she could turn the oven up really hot right at the end so that things would come out looking red hot. So they would be fooled, but the, the actual obus were completely 
uh, defective and would explode in the face of soldiers using them. German officials kept coming to inspect the factory because they couldn't figure out what was going wrong. They never could suspect that women would do something like this. The, the, the factory was um, bombarded by the Allies over and over again because the Allies knew it was a, bom uh, a bombing factory and was finally destroyed in the bombardments on April 10 and 11. Many prisoners died in the bombardments. So at that point, they were set out on a death march. Zaza's book begins on April 13, 1945, when the nine were set on the roads for a death march These, to an unknown destination with no food or rest. Many, some of them had been working, they'd gone through the bombardments, they hadn't eaten in days. The death marches are really an important part of the war. All across Europe and Germany, it was kind of the most deadly time for camp survivors, except for those who had been exterminated upon arrival. Um, the, the Germans had, the, had this idea to empty out the camps ahead of any invading armies, possibly to hide their crimes, but not really because they left piles of bodies and whatnot. There's some thought that it's because Himmler, who was in charge of the concentration system, um, thought was delusional and thought they could use the slave labor to rebuild the army and rebuild these weapons, but probably, most likely, he knew the war was lost and he wanted to use these prisoners as collateral to create his own deal with the U.S. He kept trying to get in touch with the U.S. to say, Let, make a deal with me and we'll go against Russia, the real threat, communists. So he was up until the end trying to keep these prisoners in this kind of weird, uh, endless marches. And I spent a day in the archive in, in Paris, a huge folder of, on the death marches, which is just, you know, one after, there's hundreds of them, and they were just, they're just maps where they were, and then finally they'll end with, you know, 50 bodies executed here, you know, they're just, because there was not, no provisions, there was no idea where they were going, they, there was no um, food, there was nothing for them. And 35% of the people who were still alive at that point would die in these marches. And there was mass executions taking place. And for the women, the first day of the march, at the end, well, the first two days, because they basically marched two days without stopping, um, at the end, they were forced to march over a pile of male prisoners who had just been executed. The guards wouldn't let them walk any other way but on top of the bodies. So the women knew that they had only one choice. They either had to escape or they were going to die. And that night they, they talked and they decided that they would escape. So we followed this, Sophie and I tried to follow a rough map of their journey. So the death march went from Leipzig to Oschatz. They stopped for two hours in Wurzen, but otherwise it was um, over 60 kilometers. They were hallucinating, no water, no food already. And they were, one had diphtheria, one had, Nicole had just come from the infirmary with, with pneumonia. Um, Jackie had diphtheria, Zinka had TB, so they're not in great shape. But they escaped near Oshatz, somewhere near there. We, we looked at a list of the towns that are mentioned by all the different accounts, but the names and the towns were confused. I knew that they traveled for nine days, we were trying to sort of figure out where they went, and they, um, I decided at that point that if I wrote a book it would take that framework of that, um, those days to write my story, but they found the U.S. troops in Colditz. So this was, in one way we could be we could see the landscape, but I couldn't quite figure out how it all worked. Then um, we drove to Buchenwald, which was really a turning point for me. Um, it was the first time I'd ever been to a concentration <coughs> camp. And um, at the time I thought that women had been to Buchenwald because Leipzig is an administrative satellite of Buchenwald and I wasn't deeply enough in my research to understand how it worked. They actually never were in Buchenwald. They were in Coven's book and sent directly to Leipzig. But um, at this point, I was still kind of thinking I would write an essay that I had questions about uh, that nation memory and individual memory and how does a country come to terms with its past. And I was definitely reflecting on that. It was this is 2017, right after the elections. I'm thinking about America's coming to terms with their power past. I had just this idea of, a, of an essay. But when I got to Bougainville, I was sort of overwhelmed by it. And, um, you can see it was really cold, it was a really miserable day, and Sophie and I had really warm coats, and we were only going to be there for a few hours, so it was, it was a stunning experience. I had questioned a lot the idea of visiting sites of suffering and this idea of dark tourism, and I worried about this, you know, was it purient voyeurism? I had a lot of questions like that, but I have to say, it was, it was a moment when I thought, I don't really know what, what, I'm, what I'm grappling with here. When I got home, I, I realized there just was so much of the story that I didn't know that I couldn't write an essay. And right around then, right when I was sort of giving up hope, thinking like, ah, this is just way bigger than I can tackle. Um, the archivists from the little Leipzig Memorial Museum sent me a list um, from the Nazi records. 
and the list had my, um, my aunt's name on it. There is Christine Polievsky. And someone had written Hélène in the margin. And then um, I saw that Zaza's name was just above hers, though they misspelled it. And I saw that um, Lon was just there. And that I thought maybe that's Jose. And I saw Gigi up there. And that was like the beginning for me of like, oh my gosh, archives are amazing. <laughs> Um, the, also, just to get something that is actually a Nazi record and to find your family's name on it is a very powerful thing. So this is a little bit of a detour because then I decided to go to the, the archives in Paris, and this is my first time ever doing an archive trip. I, I'm not a historian, and I um, you have to go online. You have to reserve a document ahead of time, um, and you know you go online and it's this huge uh, long list. You know the resistance. Oh, that's you know, like women. The resistance. That's thousands. Like how do you choose? It's like a needle in the haystack. Well, I found one woman who happened to be in Hasag. When I typed in Hasag, Leipzig Hasag, the, the slave labor camp, she came up. So I thought, well, I'll look at her box, Odette Kilpol. I have no idea who she is. And I really, at this point, was almost giving up this project. I thought, this, I really felt like I was way over my head. And that this, but I thought, well, I'll just go because I reserved it and I'll just do the day trip. And I get the box. And what do I find? One of the first things I find when I open this box I don't know if you can see, but on the far right, that's the original list. So, she, so I start, I'm holding the actual original list, and the, the person that wrote Hélène in the margins is her, Odette. And I realized, so she knew, she knew, and then I find out the story about Odette Pilpol, which is an amazing story in its own. So she was, if you look online, you'll find out all that she did during the war, like as a resistance. She worked as a, in the third arrondissement, she was um, an administrator, she, she hid Jews, she changed papers, she warn people. She, at one time she was caught by the French police. She talked them out of arresting her and told the two, France is going to win this war and I will come to your trial afterwards. And they let her go and she did. They didn't, they didn't die afterwards. And she, she did all this incredible stuff. What's not online is what she did in the camp, which is amazing. Because in the camp she kept being an archivist. She kept keeping track. And on the right there is a book that she made she took from scraps of paper that she sewed together where she wrote down the name of everyone. She wrote down where they were arrested, um, what camps they'd been to, and their address of their family. She was keeping a record. She understood how important a record is, that if someday someone found this book, they would know who was here or they could contact, they would have a, find, a way that, to let the families know to keep the story alive. And she, instead of leaving during the death march on April 13, she hid and stayed behind and stole as many documents as she could before they were destroyed from the Nazi office. And then afterwards, when she was liberated in the few, first few days, from memory, she tried to write as much as she could remember of who was there and when. And one of the things that's interesting is, on the right, this was a really important document for me, on the right, um, she's making an annex because the list that she stole from the Nazis was only up till July. And Nicole and Jackie came later in September, that last group of the 5,700. So she's made a list, an annex of the people that came later. She's made lists of people who were deported and exterminated. And she also, on the right here, on the far right, um, after everyone left, she and the people that stayed behind uh, found their friend, uh, Anne-Marie Pompano, who died in the bombardments of the factory. They dug up her body and they buried her. And she's written, a little, made a little map of where they buried the body so they can find it, let her, find it later and give it, recuperate it for the family. So I was just so blown away by, it. first of all, that there, there, there was the list that had meant so much to me, and also how much this woman worked to keep this story going. He, and her box was just full of all these little things. Well, I'll never know. There was one little piece of paper that said, Je suis rentrée, on peut se voir, which meant someone else who was deported put a, a letter in her box that said, I'm back, let's, let's talk, or we can see each other. And she kept that piece of paper, so it was someone important. And she put that in the archive. So then I thought, okay, I'm not going to give up this story. I'm going to go visit. I'm going to try to meet the family. So I contacted the editor of the mag of the book of Zaza, and I, through the editor, I met. I contacted her nephew Pierre Sauvignon, and Sophie and I drove to La Rochelle to meet him. So this is an older photograph. He's much older now, but there he is as a young man. Zaza's on his right, and Zaza's husband Rene is on his left. And in, what he's got there is this electric typewriter. It was a newfangled object. He was showing to her that he had this thing called an electric typewriter and he could type up her written manuscript. And he told me about how he typed it and then he later entered it into the computer and then, and then he, um, he was the one that really 
pushed getting her book published after her death. But also from him, I learned a story that I hadn't really reckoned with, which was this story of trauma. Um, he, I had always thought that Zaza, because she's her story of the escape is a really cheerful account. It's like all happy. And she even says, I'm the optimist, and even Nicole says, Zaza sees the leaves when we're all just thinking about how hungry we are. So I thought she had a happy life. She, but then they survived, they met each other after the war, they had children. And so I was expecting this to be the happy story of my nine. But uh, when I asked Pierre about his cousins, her, um, their children, he said, oh, this is really where it's quite sad because one of them committed suicide, one of them had a failed at suicide attempt and is permanently institutionalized, a third died in a mental hospital, and the fourth is sort of barely functioning. And so it was, he had tears in his eyes when he was telling me this, and I, and I sort of said, why? Why do you think that is? And he said, well, neither Lene nor Zaza could ever talk about the war. They never spoke of it. They never, it was as if it didn't happen. But the children knew. They could feel it. And they, there's a thing they talk about in transgenerational trauma that what isn't manifested, what can't be spoken, then becomes reenacted by the children. And this is really, I think, a really clear and tragic um, illustration of that. Um, I was also able to find uh, Jacqueline Aubert du Boulet from the list that Odette, I mean, that, um, yeah, Odette Pilpol stole. Um, I knew that she was one of the 5,700 now with Nicole. She was a war widow, right? Her husband died uh, soon after the beginning of the war. Which, um, she had diphtheria while in the camp. After the war, she married Charles Feld and she became a film director. And I found a friend of hers. I, she had no children. I, I've not been able to find any family. He told me he knew nothing about her being in the war. Charles Feld was, was a famous resistance person, but he had no idea that she was ever in a concentration camp, that she was in Robin's book or anything. She never spoke of it. But he tell, did tell me how much she loved dogs. And I found that picture online, so I was like, let's keep that one. Um, she's apparently had, from all accounts, she had kind of a throaty voice, and she was a really like, she didn't, she just said, said what she saw. She didn't suffer fools easily. She, she had kind of a dirty mouth, and she was kind of swearing the whole time, um, you know. Then the next person I found was Jose Baldanova. Um, she, so she's the Spaniard. She was the youngest one in the group. Um, she was famous, well famous. In many accounts, they talk about her beautiful singing voice. She would sing to them at night as they were going to sleep. She was raised in foster care and joined the resistance when she was 18. She was part of the Marcel network in Marseille that hid, um, uh, hit Jewish children. She was arrested in March of 1944, deported with Lon and Gigi, and that's probably how she met them. I know she was married briefly after the war, and I know that she died in Cannes. I've tried to have contact with her family, but they, they haven't um, responded. She's stunningly beautiful, though, I think. I don't know if you can tell from this picture. And they talked about her being this incredible beauty. Um, so I went on a second trip to Buchenwald because um, I wanted to travel with this Association Francaise Buchenwald d'Or et Commandos. It's a group formed by survivors after the war, and now it's descendants of victim survivors. Their mission is to support research and safeguard the memory of the camp, to keep archives and witness testimonies, and to maintain the camps as a memorial. So all things that were interesting to me. Um, and it was a ceremony of the anniversary of the liberation of the camp, which they do every year. You, many of you probably know that Buchenwald was one of the camps where the prisoners liberated themselves. Um, and uh, it was really great to travel with uh, survivor families and hear their stories and also to get tips with, from them about how they do this research and where they looked and books to read. It was a real um, wonderful resource. From one of the people in, in that group, I got a phone number from Nicole's daughter, Daniel Meyer. Unfortunately, she couldn't be here tonight. But she put me in contact with other survivors. She meets once a month with uh, women who survived Robin's book. She has a lunch with them, and I've met some of them. Um, she gave me unpublished writings of her mother, Nicole, and um, she's just been an incredible help in this whole journey. I, I call her up, I write her, and she gives me ideas. Um, and the other person I was able to find was um, online, was Guy, Guy Ahmed Daniels, Guy Guy. Is he his family here? Was there any? Oh, bonjour. So, oh, oui, bonjour. <laughs> so this is, um, oui. Um, so Olivier and uh, Guy Guy's grandchildren? Is this so? Yes. Um, who, uh, so I found, um, through Olivier, I was able to find, to speak to his, his mother, Laurence, which is Gigi's daughter. Um, so glad you came. So <laughs> oh, oh, right, that got, 
Wonderful. Um, uh, they were able to tell me about Gigi, what happened to her after the war, um, that she married a Dutchman named Wilhelm, who survived Mauthausen. Uh, you, can, you can correct me if I have this wrong. <laughs> but um, Gigi and William, Wilhelm met outside the interrogation office of the Gestapo after they'd been arrested. And, and Wilhelm said that if he survived, he would find her and marry her. They lived outside of Paris, and she died in 2007. She's, from the accounts that I've read, she's, she was kind of the peacemaker. She was very easygoing and kind of helped smooth uh, some of the conflicts or the tensions in the group, and kind of the, kind of the diplomat, um, and was very uh, uh, easy, you know, easy to, easy with the group. <laughs> um, and and the, her family led me to the, one of the people I had no idea how I was going to find was Mina. Um, and that's Yvonne Le Guyot Mena. She was a Brit Breton. Um, so I, through Olivier, I was able to find Mena, and I interviewed Mena's son-in-law and then the grandson. Um, the grandson knew more than the father about the story, um, which is often the case. The, um, the grandchildren tend to know more often because the, the survivors will tell them more. They sort of protect the children, their own children, and don't want to talk about it with their own children. Sort of like my Tante Hélène telling me, who was kind of a little bit distant, that instead of telling her own uh, daughter. Um, she was born in Brittany. She was, grew up as a working class girl in Paris. Mena and Gigi became lifelong friends. Gigi comes from an upper class family, well-educated, and Mena is much more working class, but they formed a friendship in the, in the camp. She said that she, she wasn't very politically engaged. She sort of said she joined the resistance because she fell in love with somebody. Um, and uh, she never talked about the war except with her daughter. Um, sadly, she had a very bad marriage, but she was very close to her daughter. She talks about going to, uh, or her grandson talks about how they would go to Galerie, Galerie Lafayette and have tea and try to speak with English accents. They were very whimsical and playful together. She made a quilt for her daughter with the coat that she wore during her escape, which I found really moving. It's a kind of a cloak of protection that she put on her, on her baby and then later turned that, that coat into a stuffed animal for her grandson. She died in 1973. So at this point, I realized that I had to go to Ravensburg because that was really the story. That was really where they had been and where most of them met. Um, most, of, most women prisoners deported to Germany passed through this camp unless they went directly to Auschwitz. Um, it was a camp built only for women, and it's the second largest concentration camp after Auschwitz broken up. It's really the capital of crimes against women. It's 90 miles north of Berlin, and it's really a central part of their story, and it's also a central part of the story, <coughs> because, it's, uh, because it was a camp for women, in a lot of ways it was forgotten and marginalized. But what happened to women's bodies, what happened to pregnant women, what happened to women giving birth, how women were treated, is really an important testimony that needs to be told and remembered. In fact, the history of the memorialist site is, is part of the story, because three years after, the war, Soviet tanks flattened the site completely, and Ravensburg book was basically forgotten or marginalized. It was known um, as a communist shrine of the struggle against fascism. There's a, there's a statue in Ravensburg book that was put up at this time in the Soviet era called the Tragende, which is a woman named Olga Banario carrying another woman. And Olga Banario became a communist uh, sort of hero after she was killed. She was a communist hero and she was a great communist leader, but the fact is she was Jewish and she was killed because she was Jewish, and that was never mentioned. Nor was it ever mentioned how many Jews were killed, or that they, that this, the camp was known for as the massive sterilization of Sinti and Roman girls as young as eight to 13. They injected acid into their fallopian tubes, or, or the, the murder of so many, what they called them asocials, basically sex workers, lesbians, transvestites. Um, many women who were, had been in the camp who, who returned didn't speak of it. It was a kind of taboo, and in some of the, um, Testimonies that I've read, they, women said that if they told people that they'd been there, they, marriages were called off. They, had, they were the women who had suffered through that camp were considered um, sullied and um, in, um, pure. Um, so a lot of the survivors kept quiet until around the late 1960s when they started to be um, these Holocaust deniers. And some, one of the uh, one historian in France said there were never any um, gas chambers at Pavlin's book, and that really. Uh, spurred anchor amongst the survivors, and they decided that finally they had to speak up. The, on this trip to Germany, I was able to really retrace the escape route, um, and 
can see the map here. Each, I don't know if you can tell, but each little blue thing is a town that they stopped in. And um, what I was able to see was how short the distances were between each place they stopped. It was only sometimes four or five kilometers, which showed just how exhausted they were, how uh, difficult it was for them to keep moving every day. I was able to see the landscape, which started out flat, then became really hilly, and there were hiding places, where the places that were dangerous for them. And I saw, found some important landmarks, which is on the right is the bridge, the Mulda, the bridge over the Milda River. This, is the, this was on the final day of their escape. They had to cross the Mulda to get to the American troops that they knew were on the other side, but the bridge had been completely destroyed. And it was a, it was, the river was in flood, it's April, and they had to climb down a ladder and go over rocks and climb up. Some of them didn't know how to swim. Things were lost in the water. In many of the accounts, this is some part that they talked about that they remembered as being the most terrifying. I think um, they lost, I think Zinka lost the only photograph she had of her daughter. And they lost the sack of potatoes. So the last person that I was uh, able to find, and this also with help of Olivier and his genealogical wizardry, was um, René Le Bon, uh, who is Zinka. Um, the co what confused me about René, first of all, was finding out that her name was René, and then, and then she was called sometimes René Le Bon and sometimes René Le Bon Le Bon, and I couldn't, I, and then I knew she, later she was called Chatenay in her military record. I couldn't figure it out um, because she married someone named Le Bon. So that was the, uh, the thing that Olivier helped me figure it out. Anyway, I found out afterwards that her, so found out that she had, after the war, she married, so she gave birth to, to a baby named France, that she named France in prison in Fresnes before being deported to Germany. She probably would have been deported earlier, but because she was pregnant at that point, the, the French didn't deport her. They kept her. She was sort of saved because she was pregnant. But as soon as 18 days after she gave birth, the baby was taken away, and she was soon deported to France. I mean, to, to Germany. Um, I heard from the records that Zinka was really brave. She was. She's in a lot of testimonies. They talk about her. She was really little. She had a gap in her teeth. She had a. She didn't flinch when there were bombardments. She was uh, spirited, and she always talked about her daughter France. And she always talked about getting back to France. Um, uh, I knew she caught TB in the camps and that she died, that she suffered from it the rest of her life. I found out that she married after the war to a man named Chatenay who, and that she had a child, um, a boy named Gilles Chatenay, who happened to be a Lacanian an analyst. And I have a friend who's a Lacanian analyst in Marseille. So I called her up and I said, do you know Gilles Chatenay? And she said, yes, and I, she put me in touch with him. And when he wrote, I wrote to him, since the beginning of this project, I've been trying to find France. I figured she must still be alive. I want to know what happened to the baby. And when I talked to Gilles, he said, do you want to talk to my sister France? <laughs> I almost <laughs> fell out of my chair. <laughs> so um, there she is. I, um, I drove with Sophie to D, where she lives, and then France. So um, really, this whole journey has been a, been a big lesson for me about the importance of these stories where I began kind of full of self-doubt and thinking, you know, is it, this is kind of like, this is not my business, and what do I know, and I'm not a historian. More and more I learned how important it was, because when I went to see France in D, she didn't know this story about her mother. Mm -hmm. She didn't know that her mother had talked about her. She didn't know that her, she didn't really know any of this stuff, nor did she know all the other accounts which I was able to send to her when people talked about her mother. And even one book where there's a drawing of her mother, where she was kind of a hero in the camp. And she didn't, know really how much for her, France, the fact of France was important to the survival and the motivation of the group. In fact, the whole group talked about getting back to France, both the country and the baby. So it was a really moving uh, meeting with, with uh, France. Um, for so long, women have kept quiet about their role in the resistance. De Gaulle asked women to step back and let men take the glory. In the 1038 Compagnons de la Liberté, only six of them are women. These were the people he named after the war as the leaders of the resistance. Only six of them are women, four of them were already dead. The resistance was, was there was at least 40%, if not 50% female. And there's a famous leader, um, Marie-Madame Forcade, who I spoke about earlier, who led the most important and the largest intelligence network in France. She was not named. Um, so what women did in, in the resistance wasn't valued, and even though many were leaders and many died, um, the turning point, as I said before, was the Holocaust de de deniers. And as the women got older, I think they realized that they would be, they would be all forgotten. And more importantly, um, I've said this over and over again, it wasn't so much that they would be forgotten, but the women who had died would be forgotten. 
And so they start to speak up. So this my story, the nine, is going to be about uh, how these women resisted, how they befriended each other, how they helped each other survive, how they escaped together, how they got home, what happened to them after liberation, and why it took them 60 years to tell their story. Blah.